Hi, this is Greg Fish. Thank you so very much for coming along once again for this limited edition podcast, Because I'm Richard's Son. And I'm sharing with you chapters from my book, Because I'm Richard's Son, and I hope that they have been speaking to your heart and help you to understand that you have a connection with someone who loves you very much. That even if you don't have a good earthly father, like I was blessed to have, you do have a great, great heavenly father. You can find out more about my book at CorbinFosterMedia.com. That's CorbinFosterMedia.com. And this is a CorbinCast podcast. Today, the final chapter that I will be reading for you, and it's entitled, The Old Man. There are nights when I lay in bed, unable to sleep, and I open my eyes to stare into the pitch black dark. If the curtain hasn't been closed perfectly tight, the faintest wisp of light cuts in. Because my eyes have become accustomed to the dark, even the smallest degree of light can make outlines in the room visible to my eyes. It's awesome that even the sparse light of night, even the gentle glow of the moon, can be enough to break through the hollow emptiness of the early hours. Then I soak in the moment, allowing God to drench me to the core with His presence. Darkness can never defeat the light. And there are times in the dark cave of total emptiness when you can take advantage of the deep surrounding darkness to recognize the still, small glow. The old man sitting on the couch next to me hunched over his cane, dancing in and out of lucidity. At times, a stream of saliva fell from his mouth, As if waking from a weird dream, he'd pull out his hanky and wipe the spit away, surprised that it was there. Those solid, muscular shoulders were replaced by pointed bones. His sweater, a landscape of sharp hills and valleys. Hey, son, he'd say, realizing that I was there, my hand gently rubbing his back. He took a frail breath and said, You know, I I looked in the mirror and I didn't recognize the man I saw. I asked myself, who is that old man? All I could do was listen and strain to hold back the tears. But then I'd break in with the most important words I could say, words that needed to be heard again. I love you, Dad. I love you too, son. There are a hundred thousand things I wish I'd said and a hundred thousand more questions I wish I'd asked. But then our life had been so full, so rich, so complete, it seemed that few words needed to be given air. These were sacred moments, moments that would last a thousand years. Here was the man who carried me out into the hallway of the trailer where we lived when I was a baby. The little hat on my head fell off and rolled down the hallway as my mother screamed, Richard, his head fell off. (laughs) I can only imagine the sly smirk on dad's face as he drank in the moment. Here was the man who would lay next to me on an air mattress in a two-man pup tent on a fishing trip at Lake Monroe, Indiana. The trot lines had been set, and a 10-pound catfish awaited the next day. But that night, as we drifted off to sleep, my dad's voice rang out in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this beautiful day you've given me with my son, Gregory. Here was the man who swatted my bottom the day I punched my sister in the face. As I swung away, I thought she would move. We'd played that game so many times before. I'd say, I'm going to close my eyes and swing my fist, and you'd better move. That day, with friends nearby, she decided to take one, I suppose, to glory in my fall. Truthfully, though, the punch might as well have gone straight to my face, and I was willing to take the swat on the bottom for my horrible game gone awry. Here was the man who would torment us in the van when he'd pull out his harmonica to play. He'd blow the reed quickly from one side to the next and then begin to puff away a tune. Dad, would you put that away? 
here was the man who wanted to share his love of the book of Revelations with his kids, not realizing I was utterly terrified by the imagery. There would be nights I could see an orangish harvest moon and I would think it was running red with blood. I'd pull the covers up and pray, Jesus, please don't come tonight. Please don't come tonight. I would listen for a trumpet or the rumble of horsemen as carefully as a child would listen for reindeer hooves at Christmas. He wanted us to enjoy thinking about the end times like he did, but it only scared young Greg. Yes, sitting next to me on that blue couch was an old man that even I hardly recognized. An old man that I knew to the bone. There by his side, I made Dad a promise that seemed to bring happiness to his spirit. Dad, I've never been a shouting Christian like you, I began. Dad wasn't concerned about what others thought. When he was blessed with a special understanding of the presence of God, he would shout in joy. Dad, I've never been a shouter, I said plaintively. But when I know you finally see Jesus face to face, I'll shout with you. You shout in glory, I'll shout here. He nodded in agreement. We prayed for a miracle, and I believe we got one. Dad lasted longer in his fight against pancreatic cancer than anyone could have imagined. Maybe it was out of pure Richard Fish (laughs) bullheadedness. But death wasn't about to push my dad around. The day came when Dad was so emaciated. He looked like those pictures of concentration camp victims that I had been shown in high school history class. In early 2013, we were called back to Columbus, Indiana. Dad was fading fast. Those may have been his last days, but they were full of strange wonders. In the rare moment that Dad spoke, he was mostly confused. He was convinced he needed to get out of bed and take on some mysterious task. Even in dying, Dad wanted to be active. Many family members gathered around him, keeping vigil. Others came and went. One morning as I walked into his room, his wife Sharon said, Hey Richard, Greg's here. One final time, Dad spoke to me. He opened his eyes, and for a few seconds, Dad was himself. He smiled and said, Well, hey, son. And then he faded off. I will never forget those beautiful final words to me, perhaps capping off a lifetime of thousands and thousands of times where he called me son. There was one more, and it was perfect. Later that day, Dad opened his eyes, looked into the distance, and said, Hey, hon! Others in the room were confused. Who's he talking to, they wondered. Who's Don? But my sister and I understood what he was saying. Hey, hon. Yeah, I know. I'll see you in a little while. He was Sharon's husband, no doubt about that. But somewhere in his mind... He saw Mom standing at the edge of heaven, perhaps taking the edge off the transition he was about to make. I don't understand the mysteries of marriage, remarriage, and the heavenly ramifications, but I'm okay with that. Speaking of uncertain theologies, I'm not sure what to make of this next part either. I hear stories of people that have seemed to wait until they were alone in a room to slip away. I'm not sure we have that much control over those final moments, but still some think it's not uncommon for us to wait until we are alone to die. That evening of Dad's homegoing, Stephanie was exhausted and went to take a nap. I had left the room to eat a sandwich. The sun was beginning to set. That was when they came to tell us that he was gone. As the family gathered at his side, I didn't dare wait 
I knew at that moment Dad was experiencing the death of faith and the birth of sight. He was finally face to face with his life's greatest hope. Dad was crossing Jordan and running to embrace Christ. He was shouting happy. I just knew it. And so I got shouting happy for him. And I let out the biggest whoop of my life. I'm not sure that the others in the family were all that pleased with me as they cried. I let her rip. You're not supposed to get shouting happy when someone dies. But I did. I whooped. (laughs) Just as I had promised. I joined Dad in his exuberant cry. There are moments when I step beyond myself and my conventions because of a divine bond. A divine bond that attaches me to the heart of someone I love and draws me to do new things, to taste new experiences. Dad's death wasn't so much a dying as it was a glorious crossing over. And it was my joy to mark the moment with him. No Kleenex and tears for me at that moment. Nope. I shouted royally. And I did it because I'm Richard's son.